Hi, this is the voice, Michael Shavello. You're listening to the Premium Odds Cast, hosted by leading MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas, fight scientist and author of Fightnomics, Reed Kuhn, and MMA journalist Brian Heminger. The absolute best UFC betting info, picks, statistics, and analysis from the most respected authority in mixed martial arts betting, MMAOddsBreaker.com. Welcome to the Premium Odds Cast, presented by BetDSI. I'm Brian Hemminger, joined today by leading mixed martial arts odds maker Nick Alikas to break down this Sunday's UFC Fight Night 134 event, which takes place in Hamburg, Germany. If you're unfamiliar with our format, Nick and I will break down the fight card from top to bottom, providing extensive analysis and a pick for each fight after doing our film study for the event. Looking back at the last event, our premium handicapper Kyle Marley won his free bet on Junior Dos Santos. You can check out all of his plays and bets and fantasy advice on MMAOddsBreaker.com. Back to the present, UFC Fight Night 134 features a 13 fight card in total and will be aired on UFC Fight Pass and Fox Sports 1 this Sunday afternoon. Let's dive right in. Now, kicking things off on Fight Pass is a Bantamweight contest between Damian Stasiak who is 10 and 5, and Peng Wan Lu, who is 10 and 5. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Lou opened minus 140, the comeback on Stasiak, even money. And right now, looking over to our sponsored sportsbook, betdsi.eu. Right now, over at betdsi, Stasiak minus 115, the comeback on Lou is minus 105. So line margins have tightened up a little bit. And there was two action coming in this fight. It seems like it was a fairly decent opener. I know it flipped, and Stasiak is the favorite now, so a little bit more action coming in his way in comparison. But again, there's going to be two action coming in this fight. And it is a true pick'em fight. It's a tough one. I mean, Stasiak is definitely the more experienced veteran. He's fought great competition. If you think about it, I mean, he, he's facing Lou in this spot here, and he's coming off losses to Kelleher and uh, Munoz, which those guys are, I mean, top of the food chain when it comes to the Bantamweight division. So as far as UFC goes, I mean, those uh, now you're fighting a guy that's making his debut and Lou that's coming in. I mean, this is a step down in competition for sure for Stasiak. Now that's not take Lou too lightly though, because the, the guy is definitely an explosive talent. He's got power in the feet. He can uh, take you down. He's got some good wrestling. He's got some good grappling. He's got some good jujitsu as well. So the guy's a pretty well-rounded fighter, but it's his explosiveness and his ability to just put the pressure on you and just, be relentless at times. It's pretty impressive with Lou. But that said, with all those, you know, all the pressure and, and all that good stuff I just said about uh, Lou, he does tend to leave himself open a little bit. And Stasiak's the type of savvy vet that can expose a lot of those openings, especially on the ground. I think Lou's biggest weakness is the ground. So in my opinion, he's going to want to keep this fight upright or get top position on Stasiak and try to, to control if it does hit the ground on top and, and just be cautious that he doesn't get submitted. Um, but more so, if he keeps it upright, I think he's definitely the more explosive, the more powerful puncher, and he can have success doing so. But with all that said, I think Stasiak is probably going to be the one eventually getting this fight to the ground and dictating where this fight goes. And I think he's going to be able to find some success on the ground. And if he hits a scorecard, it's probably Stasiak going to edge it out a little bit because of his groundwork more so than anything else. So, And I could see it ending inside with a Stasiak sub as well. So with that said, I think it's going to be a very tough fight. Both guys are going to have their moments in it. I have to lean with the experienced veteran of Stasiak because I just think even though I, I see more potential in Lou, I think he could go farther in this division. Right now, he's still a little bit too raw for my liking. So I'm going to pick Stasiak, but it is a pick type of fight for sure. And I'm going to side with Stasiak as well. I just think that with him being an established UFC veteran and having a solid ground game and, and wrestling that, uh, Ping Wan, while he's a good prospect, I think he's going to suffer a little bit of the, the UFC jitters and Stasiak does have the better ground game. Um, I think Stasiak can hold his own on the feet, although Ping Wan will be most dangerous there. Um, he does have some good power and decent, uh, striking ability. So, uh, if Ping Wan does win, it's going to be, uh, on the feet, probably. Uh, but if it goes to the ground, I expect, uh, Stasiak to get top position, to advance position, and either look for a TKO on the canvas or potentially a submission. Uh, so I'm gonna side with Stasiak. I think that his ground game is good enough to overwhelm, uh, lose, and I expect, uh, Stasiak does get the job done here. 
Now, moving up to the light heavyweight division, we have Jeremy Kimball, who is 15 and 7, taking on UFC newcomer Darko Stozik, who is 12 and 1. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? Stosic open minus 230, the comeback on Kimball at plus 170. Right now, looking over at Bet DSI, it's minus 270 for Stosic. The comeback on Kimball is around plus 215. So a little bit more action coming in Stosic's way. I'm not that surprised. I expect it to maybe even climb to around 300 or so. Again, no disrespect to Kimball, but I think he's just outclassed here in this matchup because Stosic's a monster. I mean, Kimball's had some mixed success in the UFC thus far. I mean, he made his official debut and got knocked out by DeLima. Um, which doesn't look good, especially in a fight like this, because I can see a lot of similarities here with, with possible, possibility of Kimball maybe turtling up if Stosic brings that kind of power to him. Um, but then he did bounce back. Um, Kimball did against Stansberry and showed us that he's capable of knocking some of these big guys out. He does have knockout power. Um, but again, unfortunately for him, he, he ended up suffering a loss, uh, to another prospect in Dominic Reyes in his last fight. So some mixed results, like I said, with Kimball. And again, I think he should actually look at, at going down a weight class here because I think Stosic's going to be too powerful for him. He's the type of fighter that brings a lot of pressure. I mean, if you look at his physique alone, you can tell how strong the guy is. And with that strength, I mean, he's a bully. He's going to come forward. He throws heavy punches. He mixes in some solid kicks as well at times. He has some wrestling to look, go along with it. So how I kind of see this playing out, if Kimball doesn't land that one punch on the way in, Stosik's going to bully him to the point where I think you could see Kimball turtling up and, and possibly getting finished with the referee, just just kind of stopping and kind of feeling bad for him. So I don't think Kimball gets this upset here. I think Stosik's going to come in, perform well, and get probably a highlight reel type of stoppage here. So, again, Stosik is a little raw still. He's going to continue to improve, and this is one of the better fighters that he's faced. I mean, if you look at his resume, he's fought some okay fighters on the European scene, but Kimball's definitely a solid test for him, believe it or not, despite me kind of ripping on Kimball a little bit. I think this is going to be one of the best fighters he's fought, so keep that in mind as well. I'm not going out there telling you guys, oh, go ahead, lay 3-1 to one over Kimball here in this spot. Let's see how Stosik performs in this position, but I do think he probably gets a finish here. So the pick is Stosik to win. Honestly, Kimball is the type of guy that if he got on a decent diet, he could probably make middleweight. And Stozik is dropping down from heavyweight to fight here at light heavyweight. So there is going to be a stark difference in the physicality of the two of these fighters. Um, they're actually the same height, but Stozik is going to be a lot stronger. Um, so I think uh, Kimball, his biggest threat is going to be that he does have some power in his hands. And if he catches Stozik at some point, maybe he can make something happen. But other than that, uh, Stozik being kind of a protege of Mirko Krokop, uh, he has some devastating kicks. I mean, he's finished guys with leg kicks early in fights. So I can see him just chewing up Kimball with leg and body kicks. Uh, and as long as he has space to operate, I think that he's just going to be teeing off on Kimball. Um, Kimball really doesn't have a great takedown game. So, and I, I just don't think that he has the ability to take Stozik out of his, uh, comfort zone. Um, Stozik is a powerful, exciting striker that's making his UFC debut here, and I think that this is just a ter terrific matchup for him. And he doesn't just win this fight, he probably finishes Kimball early. So my pick is going to be Stozik. Now, moving on to the main event of the Fight Pass prelims, in the Bantamweight division, we have Davey Grant, who is 10-3, taking on Manny Bermudez, who is 12-0. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Bermuda's open minus 245, the comeback on Grant plus 195. Right now over at Bet DSI, minus 285 for Bermuda's, plus 225 for Grant. So line margins have tightened up again, and a little bit more action coming in uh, Bermuda's way. This is kind of an interesting fight. You know, I've had a ton of respect for David Grant. I think that he's actually been underrated and underestimated throughout his career, but he just, to me, I know he's had some injuries and he's had some not consistent time in the octagon. I mean, he, you know, he hasn't been fighting as often as you like to see. So it's a little disappointing to me because I think the guy had a lot of potential. And with that said, I think he's actually not getting to the point where he needs to show that improvement and getting better. I think he's actually getting worse. So that's unfortunate for David Grant because, man, he's facing – a guy in Bermudez that I've personally underestimated a little bit. I mean, if you look at Bermudez's game on tape, he's not the best striker. I mean, obviously he's a grappling based fighter, so that's what he excels at and that's what he kind of wants to do in fights. I mean, you have to start 
standing and, you know, throw some punches and kicks or whatever to set up your grappling game. So Bermudez does that and he's okay with it, but uh, he's not going to blow you out on the feet at all. So he wants to get in these grappling exchanges to win the fight. Where Grant definitely, I think, is a better striker on the feet here. I think Grant's probably the better pure wrestler here as well. But Grant, I don't know. I mean, his his conditioning hasn't looked all that great. I mean, he does tend to wear down a little bit. And if he gets in grappling exchanges on the ground, like he tends to do a lot in fights with Bermudez, he's going to get caught in a sub. So I've been impressed with Bermudez because, again, he doesn't have the greatest wrestling. He doesn't have the greatest striking. So you're thinking, man, this guy's just a one-trick pony. But the truth is, if you look back at Bermudez's last fight, that was really impressive. I mean, he fought you know, one of the best fighters he's ever faced in his life in Morales. And Morales was actually doing pretty well in that fight. But unfortunately for Morales, I mean, he played that game a little bit too long on the ground with Bermudez. And that's the kind of special talent Bermudez is on the ground. I mean, he gets around your neck. He gets around uh, your arms, your limbs. Yeah, he, he'll sub you. He'll catch something eventually. So you don't want to play that game. And I think David Grant is going to play that game a little bit too much for him. So it's hard not to like Bermudez in this spot. I mean, Grant was subbed in his last fight by Stasiak that we just mentioned. And I think Bermudez is head and shoulders above Stasiak on the ground, at least at this point of their career and how they stylistically they match up. So this is not a good fight for David Grant. So disappointed with Grant, because like I said, I, I was kind of expecting some good things from him, but I don't at this point, I think he's probably going to end up getting cut possibly after this loss to Bermudez here. So the pick is Bermudez to catch a sub along the way. I think it does eventually happen. And if you're going to bet this fight, maybe look for a sub prop. I think that's not a bad idea. So I'm picking Bermudez though. And I'm going to go with Bermudez as well. Uh, the main thing here is I'm nervous about Grant's ability to stop Bermudez if it goes to the ground. And Grant's injury history is definitely a cause for concern. I mean, the guy just cannot stay healthy. Um, I mean, he's even coming off of a staph infection after this that forced this fight to be rescheduled. So uh, Bermudez is an extremely accomplished grappler. And... Uh, really, the only thing I'm worried about in this fight is his wrestling. It's not that great. So if Bermudez cannot put Grant on his back and get this fight to the floor, then Grant has a chance. But Grant isn't a great striker either. I mean, he's had m- most of his success in the UFC on the ground. But the problem is obviously that Bermudez is just way better than Grant on the ground. So... I mean, if Grant does something silly like shooting for a takedown, I think that he gets either swept or Bermudez could tap him from his back. Um, so realistically, I think the only way Grant wins this fight is if he keeps it upright and outpoints Bermudez over the course of three rounds, because I don't see him knocking Bermudez out either. So I just think at some point Bermudez does put Grant on his back, and then at I think it's only a matter of time from there, even with uh Grant being a decent ground fighter. Um, the fact that he got submitted by Stasiak or dominated on the ground by Stasiak, um, I just think that with Bermudez being that much better than Stasiak on the ground even, um, that Grant is going to have his hands full. So um, Bermudez not having great wrestling is really the only thing keeping me from thinking this bout is a lock. But my pick is going to be Bermudez. Now, kicking off the Fox Sports 1 prelims, we have a light heavyweight contest between Justin Ledette, who is 9 and 0 with one no contest, and Alexander Rakic, who is 8 and 1. Now Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? Ledette open minus 175, Rakic at plus 145. Right now, looking over at BetDSI, is currently Ledette minus 125. The comeback on Rakic is even money, so more action coming in on Rakic, and not really that surprising. This is going to be a good fight. Now, we should say right off the rip, Ledet is moving down to the light heavyweight division. I, I'm glad to see it. I think Ledet is doing the right thing here. I mean, he's had success. He's 3-0 and in the UFC heavyweight division, and the guy's dropping down um, to look for more success, possibly, and a better fit. I think, I mean, you could see that he could trim down. He's not a big heavyweight as far as, you know, physique goes, so this was, again, I think the right move. But He's facing a very dangerous opponent in, in Rakic in this spot here. I, I mean, it's going to be close because both these guys like to stand and bang. And that's why you're seeing a pick em type of fight. And that's why the early action did come in on uh, Rakic as well. Both these guys are well-rounded. But, of course, we all know that Ledet tends to, in, to prefer to stand up and use his boxing. He does have a really nice jab. It's one of the best jabs in the heavyweight division, honestly. I mean, if you look at how he boxes and how he sets things up and how that jab is consistently in your face, it's, it's pretty you know fun to watch because he can set things up and then – 
He doesn't really have that big bomb, though, to connect and put you away. He hasn't showed that kind of one-punch knockout power quite yet. Ledet hasn't, but he, he does have some nice boxing and effective boxing. I mean, even that javelin is pretty stiff, so it can be effective, more effective than people think, at least. That being said, I think Rakic is actually the better overall striker. I think he's the overall better mixed martial artist here. I think that the leg kicks are going to be a huge factor in this fight because Rakic likes to throw him and Ledet does not like to block him. I mean, if you look back, you know, Ledet obviously had a, a flaw in his fight against um Chase Sherman. And that's – sorry, I have the tip of my tongue. I had to remember Chase Sherman here. But in that Sherman fight, if you look back, I mean, Sherman had a lot of success dropping those leg kicks. And I think Rakic can kind of take from that and, and continue it because Ledet, again, you could tell they were bothering him in that fight. He just toughed it out. He's a tough guy. I mean, he's – you know, he's, he's gonna try not to show it, but uh, they did have an impact on that fight. And I think Rakic, his leg kicks mixed in with his overall striking is gonna give Ledet quite a battle on the feet. And then their ground, I, I believe the Rakic is a little bit better as well. So I give the slight edge to Rakic actually in this fight. I do like Ledet. I mean, I've been a big supporter of his so far in the UFC. I've made some cash with him, um, already as well. So I know what kind of talent he is, but I've been pretty impressed with Rakic. And if you look back at some of his earlier fights compared to where he is now, you could see the improvement in Rakic's game as well. So, I'm on his bandwagon right now, so I'm going to pick him to win this fight. I do think that, again, he just he's the better mixed martial artist in this spot. I think Ledet is going to hang with him, and it is a pick him type of fight. So the line is appropriately set right now with it, with it being a slight lean towards Ledet. Um, I can see that. I can understand it. He's, he's faced, um, you know, again, more competition in the UFC, but I still think Rakic is going to be the one probably getting the cards here. I think both these guys are so tough that I don't think I see a finish here either way, but I think Rakic ends up squeaking out a 29-28 competitive type decision. So the pick is Rakic to uh, have a successful uh, return to the UFC light heavyweight division. My biggest problem here is Ledet, while he is a good boxer and has a great jab, I think that he was going to have more success if he just stayed at heavyweight. I mean, he was beating people. He was outpointing people. I mean, he, granted, he wasn't just destroying fighters, but... Um, he had the striking capability to make a bit of a run in the heavyweight division. Um, coming down to light heavyweight, he's going to be facing guys that have more speed. Um, that are going to be a little bit more athletic. Um, you know, these are guys that are basically heavyweights that just cut down. <laughs> so I think Ledet's going to have some issues here. I mean, Rake, Rakic is actually going to have, uh, an inch on him in height. Um, the reach is about the same. So, but Ledet does have an inch or two there. So if he can get the jab going, that's going to help him a lot. But as Nick mentioned, the, the leg kicks that Ledet ate against Chase Sherman, who is, you know, not that technical of a striker, just kind of a, a bruiser that could put some power behind his kicks. Um, you know, Rakic is an accomplished kickboxer and this guy can throw leg kicks with authority and they can really punish. Uh, I think Rakic really stacks up with those kicks because uh, Ledet is a good, solid technical boxer that can fight in the phone booth pretty well, but he just eats was had no defense for a good leg kick in that Sherman fight, and that just scares the hell out of me. Um, uh, Ledet does have a little bit of a ground game. I mean, it's not amazing, especially you know coming from a boxing background, but I mean he did pull off um, a submission. So, I mean, he is a, a capable of submitting. So if it goes to the floor, I would probably favor uh, Ledet. But, I mean, Rakic does have pretty decent takedown defense as well. So I think as long as he keeps this upright, uh, Ledet's jab is not going to be enough. Um, Rakic's, Rakic's kicks are going to add up, and I think that th those leg kicks are going to really slow Ledet down. And I think Rakic... Pulls off the victory here, so my pick is going to be Rakic. Now dropping down to the featherweight division, we have Khalid Taha, who is 12 and 1, taking on Nad Naramani, who is 10 and 2. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Naramani opened minus 215, the comeback on Taha at plus 165. Right now, over at Bet DSI, it's minus 255 for Naramani, the comeback on Taha plus 210. So again, line margins have tightened up a little bit and more, a little bit more action coming in and their money's way. And the reason being is the ground game here on the feet. 
Taha is actually a pretty explosive, pretty powerful fighter, and that's what he wants to do. He wants to keep the fight upright, and he wants to, to just punish you on the feet. He's got speed. Uh, he's got good boxing. He does have some kicks to go along with it, and they're effective because he's so powerful with them. So he does have some offensive wrestling as well and a, a little bit of a ground game, but the problem is against better ground fighters, that's where he gets exposed, and, and Nermani is just that. I mean, the guy is a complete fighter. Nermani is o- not only a good, solid ground fighter, but the guy has – Nermani also has some boxing. He's got some capable striking to go along with it. So even if it stays upright, I think it's going to be competitive with Taha being the more dangerous fighter on the feet. But the difference here and why you're seeing Nermani being a, a solid favorite against Taha is because he has some wrestling, and he's going to go for it. He's going to go for those takedowns. He knows what to expect. You're guaranteed against Taha. He's going to look for those takedowns, and there's going to be a world of difference on the ground. You're going to see – uh, how much better Nermani is when he gets top position and what he's able to do, I think. So there's a good chance Nermani does get the finisher in this fight. Um, if Taha keep it upright, it's going to be interesting, and it'll be a pretty close fight, and he's going to have a shot, but I don't think he will. I think he's going to end up going to the ground, and Nermani has a huge, huge edge there. So the pick is Nermani to win, possibly by submission. If he doesn't get the sub or a ground-and-pound stoppage on the ground, then he's going to probably squeak out, again, another 29-28 type of decision because I think Taha is going to do enough possibly if it does go to the scorecards to win at least one round with the striking. So the pick is Nermani to get the successful official UFC debut because he was supposed to make his uh, debut against uh, Hakaparist um, back not long ago, but unfortunately that fight didn't uh, end up happening last minute. So this is his official debut, and I'm glad to see him here because he's definitely a solid uh, former Cage Warriors champion and, and is a solid fighter that deserves a shot. So should be a fun fight. Nermani is the pick. And I'm going to go Nermani as well. I just think he's more well-rounded. I mean, both of these fighters are talented. Uh, Both are pretty good strikers, although I would say Taha is a little bit more dangerous on the feet um, and has more power. But Naramani, I expect, will take this fight to the floor. He has a pretty good ground game, decent wrestling. And Taha's takedown defense is not very good. So I think that's where he can kind of get exposed here a little bit. Um, we're going to learn a lot about these guys making their UFC debuts, but I just think Naramani is the more well-rounded, well-versed fighter, especially since Cage Warriors champions have had pretty good success in the UFC so far. And I think, uh, Naramani is going to be another one that to add to that list. So I expect Naramani to get the win here. Now, moving up to the welterweight division, we have Emil Meek, who is 9-2-1 and one with one no contest taking on Bartosz Fabinski, who is 13-2. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Meek open minus 285, the comeback on Fabinski, plus 205. Right now you're seeing Meek all the way down to minus 170, the comeback on Fabinski at plus 140. So margins have tied up, and there's been some action coming in on the underdog in Fabinski here. At plus 205, I understand it. I mean, stylistically, this is... A tough matchup for Meek, believe it or not. I understand that Meek is the more popular fighter, and he's probably the more well-rounded fighter of the two. Um, Fabinski is more of your typical grinder. He's He's got some strength. He, he likes to grind people out. He's got some good ground and pound. He's not a bad fighter, I mean, in all aspects of the game, but where he dominates is grinding you out. Fabinski's the ultimate grinder, and, and that's what he's going to look to do uh, here against Meek because Meek has had – Obviously, some trouble against guys that like to take him down and control him in the past as well. I mean, he he's coming off of a, a decision loss to Usman. And, of course, Usman's one of the be- better wrestlers in the weight class. So, that, I mean, you can forgive him for that, obviously. You could give him a little leeway for that. But outside of that, I mean, if you look back at some of his fights, he has been put on his back. And he's been, you know, controlled to the point where that's not what you like to see. So Meek is dangerous, and again, I think his takedown defense is getting better, and it's not going to be easy for Fabinski to, to, to take him to the ground here, but I do think Fabinski is going to probably follow, follow that game plan, and he's going to have success doing so. Um, and we should also mention that, I mean, this is, again, back at welterweight, which is his rightful division. I know uh, Fabinski did have a fight against McClellan in his UFC debut, uh, and that was up at middleweight. Then he had some success, obviously, getting the decision over Urbina in his last fight that was at welterweight. So this is back at welterweight. This is with some time off. Fabinski's had some injuries. He's had plenty of time to recover because he hasn't fought since 2015. So that is a concern here with Fabinski for me, at least is that time off, and see if that ring rust is going to be evident here in this fight. Um, because if, if so, if his cardio or conditioning or anything is lacking, Meek will probably win this fight. So. 
Fabinski is going to have to have the cardio and conditioning to grind him out for three rounds, repeatedly get the takedowns, stay on top, ground and pound if he wants to get the W here and, and kind of edge out a decision. I think he will do that. Meek's going to be hard to stop, but I think Fabinski is at least going to grind out a decision here. So I understand all the early action coming in Fabinski's way. I mean, stylistically, it's a dog or pass situation. So everybody grabbing that plus 205 or, you know, that plus money at all here in this spot uh, was probably the good move. I'm going to end up uh, picking Fabinski straight out to win this fight again. Just styles make fights, and I think Fabinski can win this fight. So, again, the caution here is definitely the time off uh, with the injuries that Fabinski's recovering from. I mean, hopefully he does look back in form. If so, I think he gets a W here. So the pick is Fabinski. And I'm going to go with Fabinski as well. The only major red flag for me that's making me nervous is the fact that Fabinski hasn't fought in – about three years. Um, he suffered an injury getting ready for a fight. And then he, I get thinking against Nicholas Dalby and then he hasn't fought again. So I'm just a little nervous about how he'll do with that first fight back after such a long time off. But other than that, I mean, Fabinski kind of has the style that is Emil Meek's kryptonite. Uh, Meek is powerful he has heavy hands, he's dangerous, he's active. So on the feet in open space, Meek will have the advantage for sure. But Fabinski is just so physically strong and he just kind of gets, he closes the distance against people and then he gets him to the floor and then he has very good top control and very good ground and pound. And that's really his bread and butter. That's that's how he fights. I mean, he doesn't stand in open space and trade. He doesn't slug it out. He doesn't really clinch that much even. It's just get him to the floor, get top position, beat him up, rinse and repeat. Um, he doesn't have the best top control, but he just repeatedly is able to get fighters to the floor. And while Meek has fought some good takedown artists, they were able to get him down. And uh, I think Fabinski should be able to do it, too. I mean, he's not quite as explosive as Usman was, but uh, Fabinski should be able to, once he gets a hold of me, he's strong enough to drag him down and then get top position and then keep doing it. And he does have, at least before the injury and before the long layoff, his conditioning did seem fine. So as long as his conditioning didn't take a hit from the long layoff, I think Fabinski gets the job done here as well. Um, I think he avoids getting knocked out on the feet and eventually grinds this out to probably a unanimous decision win. So my pick is going to be Bartosz Fabinski. Now moving on to the preliminary card headliner in the lightweight division, we have Nick Hein, who is 14-3 with one no contest, taking on Demir Hadzovic, who is 11-4. Now Nick, where did this fight open and how has the public shifted things so far? Hein open minus 175, Hadzovic plus 135. Right now looking over at Petty Asai, it's minus 170 for Hein, the comeback plus 140. So very solid opener here in this spot. It should be a competitive fight. I think you should have Hein as a slight favor here, but Hadzovic can definitely win this fight. It's a winnable fight, especially if he's able to avoid not being on his back and not getting taken down here against Hein. I know that Hein is a pretty well-rounded fighter. I mean, we've seen it time and time again, and he's actually had some very solid wins in his UFC career. Unfortunately for him, he's coming off of a submission loss to uh, Ramos. But again, that was, I mean, against a very good jiu-jitsu practitioner, a different type of stylistic matchup. I mean, Hadzovic isn't going to look to take him down and sub him. Um, he might look for a takedown or two, but he's not going to, you know, he more so the ground and pound type of fighter that keeps you on the feet, try to knock you out that way, honestly, and, and uses the wrestling in reverse. That's what Hadzovic is. So there's no submission true submission threat here in this spot um, for Hines. So he, he has that to look forward to at least. And so it's, it's his confidence has to be a little bit better. I mean, if, when you're coming off a submission loss, and you're facing another submission fighter. That might be one thing, but if you're coming off submission loss and you're facing a striker that you can probably get to the floor. I mean, like I said, I expect Hine to actually utilize that type of game plan and, and try to have success doing so. I've been going kind of back and forth on this fight, honestly, because I think Hadzovic is a better striker. He his Hind can definitely hang with him on the feet, but I think Hadzovic is the more consistent striker, the more dangerous striker, the more powerful striker, and I think he could do some damage. I mean, Hind's been clipped, even though he's got a pretty solid chin, he's been clipped and he's been hurt in fights before as well. So I think if the longer this fight stays upright, the more dangerous it's going to be for Hind as well. So tough one. I'm going to slightly lean towards Hind in this spot right now as a pure pick. 
uh, because I do think he's probably going to utilize some takedowns to try to mix things up as, as well as he can. It's not going to be easy, though, but I wouldn't be surprised if Hadzovic pulls off the upset. So it's definitely a dog or pass. I wouldn't lay the chalk here in this spot. I would probably go with the underdog if, if you're you know going to bet this fight. So it's dog or pass, but the actual pick is going to be a little bit more uh, leaning towards Hine. And I should say this. There's a disclaimer, as always, on most of these podcasts we do. Our official picks are going to be posted on – MMAOzbreaker.com are staff picks. So a couple of these that were on the fence with either Brian or I, if we decide to change our minds, we're going to um, have our official picks posted on MMAOzbreaker.com. Again, the staff picks for UFC Fight Night 134. So keep that in mind. Um, after Wands, you know, there's a chance we might switch a pick or two if it's this close. And I am on the fence with Hein and Hazvik that much. So that's why I'm even throwing it out there. So um, it is what it is, but I'm going to pick Nick Hein slightly to have the edge on the scorecards here. And I'm going to go with Hein as well. I mean, Hadzovic does have the power, and he, while he's not that technical of a striker, he does have four inches in reach and three inches in height on Hine. Um, but Hine's dealt with that before. I mean, he faced James Vick, who was significantly taller and longer than him. And while he didn't win that fight, he did win the first round before Vick made some adjustments. So Hine is, you know, as a smaller, stockier, lightweight, he knows how to deal with longer fighters. Um, he's been doing it his whole career. So I expect that he'll be able to get inside and, and stand toe to toe with Hadzovic. And, and I think that he can at least go even in terms of the stand up, uh, because while Hadzovic does have some good power, Hein has a good durability. And I think Hein is the more technically sound striker. And then in terms of getting the fight to the floor, Hein does have decent takedown accuracy. Um, he gets fights to the floor. Um, he's able to, he has a good judo background. So I think that if Hadzovic is finding some success on the feet, I think Hein can get this fight to the canvas. Uh, he can clinch and then he has trips, he has throws, he has takedowns. Um, I think that Hadzovic, honestly, just it's too one dimensional and he's not even that good in his one dimension. I mean, he is basically one third round knee from being 0 and 3 in the UFC and cut. But he did land that miracle knee against uh, Marcin Held in a fight that he was losing in the third round, and that's kept him employed so far. And, but I don't know if he'll be employed after this fight, because I think Hein does get the job done. I'm not sure it'll be the most entertaining fight. So, uh, yeah, I think that's I've talked enough about this one, but Nick Hein will be my pick. Now, kicking off the main card... We have another lightweight contest, this one between Nazret Hakparist, who is 8-2, and two, and he's taking on Mark Casey, who is 12-2. and two. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Casey open, minus 305, Hakparist at plus 225, another spot where the line has dropped significantly. Right now, Casey's minus 170 over at BetDSI, and Hakparis is at plus 140. So Hakparis goes from plus 225 to around plus 140 right now, and I agree with that as well. This is going to be a fight. I know both these guys have been pretty impressive. Casey more so. I mean, there's no question that he's kind of the person that's been hyped and the person that's kind of expected to, you know, keep on improving and go a long way. Um as far as the lightweight division goes in the UFC, one of the up and coming prospects. And if you, I mean, if you watch him fight, he is a fun guy to watch fight. I, I haven't been very, I guess, high on this guy as far as overall skill. I thought he was a little overrated, to be honest with you. He made his UFC debut. He's a heck of a striker, uh, but he's improved his game. And if you look at some of his, uh, his fights recently, I mean, that close fight was that split decision loss was actually a spot for me that I saw a lot of improvements despite losing that competitive decision. I did see a lot of improvements in Casey's game. So, you know, I think you can learn a lot from your losses. Of course, he's coming off back-to-back losses because, you know, outside of that, he lost to Hooker. But, man, I tell you what, Dan Hooker's on a roll right now. So that's not even a bad loss. So he's looking to get back on track here against Hawk Parist. But I'll tell you what, that's not going to be an easy fight. I know a lot of people are probably not as high on Hawk Parist right now overall. He did suffer a debut loss to Marcin Held. Um, and then he's had some injuries, you know, last minute again, he was the one supposed to fight, uh, Nirmani and that bout got canceled last minute because of health issues for him. So he had to pull out, but, 
I think there's a lot to like about Huck Barris, to be honest with you. And he's another one of these guys that's improving fight by fight. And, and you can see the guy's a very strong fighter physically. Um, he actually has an underrated takedown game. I mean, he was given, uh, held some fits in that fight as well. And I think held has obviously a very solid overall ground game and wrestling to go along with her takedowns, we should say as well. So I think Huck Barrist is, is pretty solid. I think that he's probably underrated in all aspects of the game. I mean, most of us know him for a little bit more of the striking ability, more of the punching power that he has and more of a threat on the feet than anywhere else. But I think he mixes things up enough that that's why this fight is going to be extremely close. And it's not going to be an easy fight for Tech Casey at all. So, you know, this is another fight, honestly, that we were just talking about going back and forth on. This is a, a pick em type of fight to me. I could see both guys having a lot of success. I'm going to go against the grain and I'm going to pick Hawk Paris to, to pull off this upset. I know the odds have dropped down quite a bit, so there's some support coming in on Hawk Paris as well, but I'm sure most people are still going to pick Di Casey in this spot here. I just, I think it's going to be close enough fight that Hawk Paris can come in here and actually steal this fight as well. It's going to be kind of sad to see, you know, possibly Di Casey losing three in a row, but I think, I mean, he, he very possibly could here in this spot. So tough fight for both guys. I think it'll be one of the best fights on this card and there's some pretty solid fights on this card. So that's saying a lot here, but I'm going to pick Huck Paris to pull off the slight upset win. I think he can win on the scorecards, man. And, and Di Casey can't underestimate Huck Paris on the ground. Huck Paris is definitely pretty solid. Like I said, his wrestling and then he'll probably look for some ground and pound and some finishing, the finishing uh, ability on the ground with his submission game as well. So, it's going to be interesting. I think it probably hits the scorecards with Huck Paris kind of edging out another 29-28 type of decision win. And I think this is Mark Ty Casey's fight to lose. Now, granted, Huck Paris is dangerous. Um, in his UFC debut, he took on Held, and he just kind of got outworked, and it was on short notice. But before entering the UFC, I mean, this guy was smashing everybody he faced in the first round. So he's definitely capable of doing that again. That being said, Mark Dye Casey is a pretty tough customer. I mean, he's been in there um, and had a close split decision fight against Drakkar Close. And then obviously he had a very impressive run to start his UFC career with uh, quite a few victories in a row. So he's on a bit of a skid now, having lost his last two fights. He's, and this is not just a, a walk in the park um, against Hawk Paris. So both of these guys have devastating power. Um, Hawk Parist can definitely do some damage on the feet. And Dai Casey, while he's not the most active striker, um, when he does connect, he has the ability to finish anybody at any moment. So that is something that you have to take into consideration. And we really haven't seen Hawk Parist tested a lot on the feet by a good striker. So that's something that I definitely think could happen here. Um, Dai Casey also does have okay wrestling. Huck Parst also is, w- could be looking to take this fight to the floor. So, um, I'm very interested to see how this fight plays out. Um, I think on the feet, Dai Casey is a little bit more capable of dragging this out a little bit. And Huck Parst, I'm a little concerned about his conditioning. I know that in his UFC debut, Against Held, he did slow down a bit, but that was also on short notice, and it was a UFC debut. So we'll see how he performs here with the full training camp, but I still think that Mark Dye Casey is a lot better than we've seen in his last couple fights, and I think that he is able to outpoint Hak Paris to potentially finish him uh, on the feet. Um, but Hak Paris is dangerous. He is fighting in Germany, which is kind of his transplanted home country, and he's going to be motivated to try to get a win after a disappointing UFC debut. But my pick is going to be Mark Dye Casey. Now, moving up to the welterweight division, we have Danny Roberts, who is 15 and 3, taking on David Zawada, who is 16 and 3. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Roberts open minus 420, the comeback on Zawada at plus 300. Right now looking over at Bet DSI, it's minus 350. The comeback is 280 on Zawada. So Roberts a solid favorite. Zawada not getting a lot of respect. He has taken this fight on short notice, so we should mention that off the rip. Um, but I'll tell you what, this is probably going to be a lot closer than the odds indicate for sure here in this spot. Um, Zawada's a tough dude, and he's faced a lot of solid competition throughout you know, his career thus far, even though it's been outside of the UFC. I mean, he's fought in the promotions like KSW. I'll tell you what, KSW is a very solid promotion. I know a lot of times they put on some gimmicky fights and, 
and, and some of the true diehard fans might not enjoy that. But overall, I mean, they do have some talent on the roster, and they're doing a lot of great things. So I got respect for KSW for sure. So they, they give fighters some solid competition. They have well-matched fights at times for sure as well. So a lot to like, and that's, again, that's one of the places that he's, you know, fought a lot of his career at. So Zawada's facing good competition outside of the UFC, and he's stepping in on short notice, uh, deservingly so, to get on the roster. I mean, he's a pretty well-rounded fighter, um, really solid in all aspects of the game. The problem with Zawada is he's not going to blow you out on the feet. He's another one of these guys that's not going to blow you out with his wrestling skill. Um, so he's just very solid across the board, but, you know, he, he's not, I guess, quite talented enough to again just dominate a fight in any aspect of the game so Roberts is is going to be okay in that regard I think the biggest flaw in Roberts game I mean he showed definitely some talent I mean Roberts is capable of finishing people on the ground if you look at his debut win over Nathan Coy holy cow that was really good I mean that submission that triangle choke was really slick over a solid wrestler and then he faced another wrestler in Dominic Steele I believe the fight after that and that was a lot tougher than people anticipated but Dominic Steele is that that kind of fighter that makes fights a little bit ugly and makes him tough as well um, but outside of that he's been had some shaky results I mean he's been a little bit up and down in his career so one thing that we've noticed from Roberts is his chin is definitely a little suspect and you can't trust it. And if you look at Zawada's resume, he does have a lot of knockouts on his win or on his resume. I believe he he's knocked out maybe 11 fighters. But again, level competition a little bit different than the UFC despite it being solid. And I think that you know, with that said, if they get in a, a striking battle here, Roberts actually is the better striker. And I think if Roberts is actually the more dangerous striker as well. So um, he's coming off of a Man, a devastating knockout win over Encamp, which I'm surprised. I mean, Encamp's defense, I didn't personally didn't feel it was going to be that bad in the fight, but Roberts, credit him. I mean, he got the job done over a very intriguing prospect in Encamp. So he's got some confidence going his way right now, and he does have some power on the feet, and he's a finisher, man, and he's, you know, he's a pretty solid fighter in his own right. So I'm going to lean a little bit more towards Roberts in this spot. I think his, his speed on the feet is going to be a factor here. I think Zawada is going to want to take, mix in some takedowns, get top position. I think he can avoid being submitted by Roberts on the ground. Um, if it stays upright, Zawada is just going to have to put them, some power into those punches and try to rock that chin of Roberts and possibly finish him that way. So with all that being said, I think it's probably, again, going to be more competitive than the current line indicates, but I'm still going to pick Roberts because I think he is a little bit ahead of Zawada at this point. But I would not lay the chalk on Roberts, that's for sure, in this spot. And I wouldn't be surprised if Zawada does pull off this upset win. I'm just not that sold on Roberts yet, I guess, more than anything else. So it is what it is again. I'm going to pick Roberts to get the W here, but I'm not a confident pick. I'm definitely nervous about this one because uh, Zawada is a capable striker with some power, and he does have a decent ground game too. So um, on paper, he should be able to hold his own with Roberts. The, the big thing here, though, is that he is stepping in on pretty short notice, so he hasn't had a full training camp, um, and Roberts has, is pretty much a savvy US, UFC veteran at this point. Um, the guy is improving. He showed some pretty good hands in his last fight. I thought uh, uh, he's definitely capable of knocking just about anybody out. But the, on the flip side, he's capable of getting knocked out by just about anybody because his chin is not very good. Uh, he's now been knocked out violently twice in the UFC. And if Zawada clips him, he could definitely finish him. Um, Roberts is a good athlete, and I do think that he can explode in and connect and get out of the way. But um, his striking defense isn't amazing. And when your striking defense isn't amazing and you do have a bad chin, um, that's not a great recipe for long-term success. So uh, there's definitely a possibility that Zawada pulls this off, and it almost certainly is going to happen if Zawada wins. It's going to be by knockout. But I think Roberts can avoid the knockout. I think that he can put the pressure on Zawada, make him fight on the back foot, and I think that he can make Zawada a little uncomfortable and wear him down a little bit, especially with Zawada stepping up on short notice. I, I think that he has a limited zone uh, of opportunity to to finish this fight, and if that time frame passes, then I think Zawada will be a little tired, and Roberts can take over. So my pick is going to be Roberts. I'm not crazy confident about it because of his chin, but uh, I do think that he can pull this one out. Now moving all the way up to the heavyweight division, we have Marcin Tabora, who is 16 and four, taking on Stefan Struve, who is 32 and 10. Now Nick. What's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? 
Tabura open minus 175, Struve plus 135. Right now over at BetDSI, it is actually Tabura minus 240, the comeback plus 200 on Struve. So line got bet up a little bit. And again, stylistically, I'm not surprised where it's at right now because I think Tabura should be a, a solid favorite over a guy like Struve. Struve has been one of the better heavyweights we all know. I mean, on the roster for a while now. Bit inconsistent with his performances as well. And we all know that he had some time off with some health issues. Um, but since then, you know, he came back and he's had some up and down results. I mean, last two fights, he's, you know, not performing up to his ability. That lost to Orlovsky last fight. I mean, Orlovsky has kind of rejuvenated his career, uh, you know, during this, that little win streak that he had going there. Um, and it, it's been surprising. So you got to give, Arlovsky some credit for that win. Maybe it wasn't such a bad loss for Struve is what I'm trying to get out here with that, but it was a surprising one still. Um, and then the loss of Volkov, of course, for Struve as well didn't sit that well. Um, but with all that said, he does have some talent. I mean, he's a very long fighter. He has ability on the feet. Um, he knows how at times to use that length. I mean, not as consistently as you'd like to see it, but he's got good through submitting, uh, submission ability on the ground. We all know that as well. So he's a tough out, but the problem is I think Struve is still a little bit too slow. I think Tabur is going to have the speed edge on the feet. I think he is going to be able to possibly rock that chin of Struve. We've said time and time again, Struve kind of has a suspect chin, but man, I, I tell you what, it's weird because he, he has taken some big shots in the past and not gone down either. So maybe we, again, we underestimate his chin somewhat, but, and Tabur is not exactly the most powerful puncher in the UFC either. So, I mean, it, there's a good chance Struve does survive against Tabura if it does stay upright on the feet. But I think Tabura is going to be able to, again, with the speed, to close that distance and end up catching uh, Struve along the way. If not, he could get the uh, the fight to the ground. I think he could drop some bombs on the ground as well. He just has to be careful because Struve's long limbs, he's got to avoid those triangles and armbar attempts that he's going to be possibly throwing up. But I think Tabura's defensive skill set is enough to kind of neutralize and and not have to, to true be as much of a threat, especially on the feet, or I'm sorry, on the ground with his uh, submission at- attempts getting thrown up there. So I think Tabura can get some takedowns, can take this fight to the ground. He'll have some success doing so. If he goes that route, I think on the feet, he's actually going to have a little bit of success as well. So um, Tabura bounces back. I know he suffered kind of a surprising loss. I mean, he was winning the fight against Derek Lewis. And then Derek Lewis turned it on, um, you know, late in that fight and, and got the knockout win, which – it was impressive, I mean, because again, I think Tabura was well on his way to get, to get the W there. And of course, before that, Tabura ended up, you know, getting a shot against Verdum and ended up losing a competitive decision. He was, he was looking okay in that fight as well. So I think Tabura's gonna bounce back here, get back on track, and he is one of the better heavyweights on the UFC roster right now. So I think Tabura's gonna continue, you know, his climb towards a t- potential tighter shot eventually. I mean, he's he's a few fights away from that for sure right now, but it starts here with uh, a solid win over Struve and maybe a highlight type of reel for him as well. So the pick is Tabura to get the W over Struve. And I think Tabura gets it done as well. Um, the, the big thing that makes me nervous, obviously, is the size disparity. Um, while Tabura isn't that much lighter than Struve when they weigh in, uh, he's going to be given up six inches in reach and he's going to be about 11 inches shorter. But that being said, uh, or at nine inches shorter, sorry. But that being said, Stefan Struve has never been great at using his height and reach in fights. Um, he stands up tall and just makes him hurt more when he finally gets dropped because it's a longer way down. Uh, Struve allows people to close the distance on him way too easily. His takedown defense is pretty terrible. And his chin is not very good. So there's a lot of things that he does not have going for him here. Um, he, he is improving as a striker. He has some decent power and he does have some, a bit of a submission game, but, uh, I think Tabora's ground game is better than Struve's. Um, unless Struve can like lock in some kind of crazy triangle off of his back. I, I just don't really see a, an easy way for him to win unless he finally learned how to jab and, um, it's just unlikely at this point in his career that he's been in the UFC for so long and still has been unable to keep guys at distance. Um, Marcin Tabura has pretty good wrestling. I think if he wants to, he can drag this fight to the floor and beat up Strew from top position. And on the, on the feet, Tabura should be able to get inside. I mean, Tabura had a lot more success against Andre Olovsky than Struve did, even though Struve has a huge height and reach advantage. So, I think Tabor is probably the better striker, the more powerful striker, definitely, and he does have a better chin. So 
Uh, if he steps inside and they're both trading toe to toe, I think it's Struve that goes down and not Tabora. And if all else fails, Tabora should be able to, uh, take Struve down and beat him up from top position or work for a submission. Although I don't think anybody's ever submitted Struve, at least in the UFC, it would be much more likely that Tabora could finish him with ground and pound from top position, kind of like Overeem did. So I'm going to side with Tabura. I just think that he's the more well-rounded, capable fighter at this point, and Struve just has too many flaws. So my pick is Tabura. Now dropping down to the middleweight division, we have Vitor Miranda, who is 13-6, and six, taking on UFC newcomer Abu Azatar, who is 13-1-1 one one with one no contest. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? As a tar open minus 165, the comeback on Miranda, Miranda plus 125. Right now you're looking over at Bet DSI and the line is as a tar minus 205, the comeback Miranda plus 170. So a little bit more action coming in on as a tar. I'm not surprised by that either because I mean, Miranda's not going to get a lot of betting support or, you know, fans kind of backing him in this spot either. He's coming off two losses in a row. I mean, the guy is an aging veteran. I believe he's 40 years old. So he's been injury prone. I mean, he just, he came off of, of a layoff with sh- shoulder surgery, a lot going on with Miranda. But with that said, he has a shot the way he matches up in this fight against Azatar. I mean, Miranda is the better striker in this matchup, the far more technical striker. Azatar is a beast. He's the type of fighter that's very aggressive, comes at you to knock your head off with his striking, right? But he leaves a lot of openings in that aspect as well. And defensively, the guy's not very good on the feet. If you look at his footage, you see him get tagged by lesser fighters. I mean, there's no question that he's hittable. And, and Miranda's kind of sneaky, slick with those kicks. I mean, he, he can batter you know, batter you on the, with his uh, kicking game, his low kicking game. He sneaks up a high kick and I mean, he's won a couple of UFC fights setting it up that way. So Miranda's no slouch. He is definitely the better technical striker. Now, as again, he's more of the one punch knockout power type of guy. And he's going to be the guy that kind of tries to implement the similar game plan um, as Vittori had against Miranda. Honestly, is, is, you know, bully him with your striking, push forward a little bit, try to get some takedowns along the way and, and try to edge out the, the win here. Um, over Miranda, but it's not going to be easy. I mean, it, honestly, if this was a Miranda that was fighting a little bit more consistently and, and um, not as injury prone, I would definitely feel a little bit better uh, about this fight for him. So I, I understand the situation here. I mean, they're matching up Azatar. He's, again, one of those fan favorites as far as his fighting ways go. I mean, the guy is, is the type of guy that detracts a lot of fans because he's such an aggressive fighter and he's a finisher. So kind of new blood in the UFC versus a guy that you know, is, is maybe not going to be on the roster too much longer. So I get this matchup here. Um, I don't know if, if Azatar is going to have that kind of success Victoria does. So I'm kind of on the fence with this and I'm actually leaning Miranda's way. So I think this matchup here is for as Azatar to get the W over Miranda, but I think it's going to backfire in the UFC. And I think Miranda's going to end up sneaking in a kick or a punch that ends up, uh, sending Azatar reeling and, and he may finish the fight off. So I think Miranda's getting a little bit underestimated in this spot and it's a definitely a dogger pass situation. I would not lay the chalk. I know a lot of you guys or out there are firm believers, and I, I mean, it's not going to be a popular opinion, but I just don't trust it. I don't think Azatar's defense is good enough, especially against a, a guy that's going to want to stand and strike with him and try to get through. So if Azatar cannot get steady takedowns and hold Miranda down, it's going to be interesting on the feet. So the pick is Miranda to actually get the upset win, in my opinion here. Uh, Azadar is a talented fighter, and he's very dangerous, but he's also sloppy uh, and Definitely has defensive lapses. Like on the feet, he could crack Vitor Miranda, but I think it's much more likely that Miranda, an accomplished striker, um, is able to outpoint a Zader and connect and do some damage on the feet uh, with a Zader. Um, I just don't see Miranda getting suckered into a brawl, and I think that he's defensively sound enough to avoid uh, getting clocked by a Zader, and I think he can counter effectively. Um, really the only thing I'm worried about in this fight, because on the feet, I think Miranda can blow Azader out. Um, but Azader does shoot for takedowns. He doesn't have the greatest offensive wrestling, but, uh, Miranda doesn't have amazing takedown defense either. So if Azader can get Miranda down and keep him down, that's definitely a good path to victory for him. He also could land like some kind of crazy looping haymaker, um, I mean, it's not impossible that Miranda can block and avoid everything. So um, 
I'm not going to completely say that it's out of the realm of possibility that a Zader can't knock Miranda out on the feet, but I do think Miranda has a huge edge there. Um, but on the ground, uh, Miranda is vulnerable. He's, he's not particularly great um, with his takedown defense. He doesn't have that great of a submission game. So uh, a Zader could get top position and ride this out and do some damage from top position because he is very powerful. So that's my big pause for concern. But um, overall, I think that Miranda can get the job done. I think uh, he is a good enough striker that he can do some damage against a Zader, especially when a Zader opens up and leaves some of those huge holes in his defense. Um, I think Miranda can connect, and I think that Miranda potentially could finish this fight on the feet. So my pick is going to be Miranda, but I'm mainly worried about the takedowns. Now moving on to the co-main event of the evening in the light heavyweight division, we have Glover Teixeira, who is 27 and 6, taking on Corey Anderson, who is 10 and 4. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Teixeira opened minus 300, the comeback on Anderson plus 220. Now over Bet DSI, it's minus 160 for Teixeira, the comeback on Anderson is plus 135. So line basically got cut in half. And Anderson at plus 220, I take my hat off to all those guys that gobbled up that line because there's no question the line should never have been that high. And right now, I mean, you're not going to see it climb back up to minus 300. So you guys got some great value on that line, win or lose. It was a great take. So that said, this is going to be an interesting fight. I mean, it's one of those matchups that, of course, Teixeira is getting thrown kind of to the wolves a little bit. I know that's crazy to say, but I mean, even in the last fight, I think they were trying to get him beat by Serkunov and it just didn't happen because Teixeira is, is just the better fighter. I mean, he's just stylistically wasn't a great matchup for Serkunov and Glover looked good in that win. So it was impressive. I think they're trying to do the same thing here though, with Anderson kind of feeding uh, Teixeira to Anderson here. And I, I do have a little bit more faith in this matchup because I do think Corey Anderson has, has been pretty impressive. I mean, his win over Cummings in his last fight, I, I didn't expect him to out wrestle Cummings as well as he did. I mean, that was pretty impressive. So, I mean, Corey Anderson is definitely one of the better wrestlers at light heavyweight right now. And then he does have some pretty good boxing on the feet as well. Has a little bit of power. Um, got, has clean technique. It's just the chin that bothers me about, uh, Corey Anderson. I mean, as the fight progresses, sometimes he could be winning the fight and then gets clipped and gets put out. And Glover definitely has enough knockout power to do that. So that is a concern for me. Um, Glover's chin is, isn't exactly the greatest though. He's a tough guy. I mean, he's been in many wars throughout his career, but, um, he's been rocked and he's been put out. Now, can Anderson catch that chin and put him out? I think so. I think both these guys can knock, honestly knock each other out on the feet. Both of them have suspect chins. Now, of course, I like Glover's chances better if it stays primarily a striking matchup, but I think Anderson's going to mix things up and make this a dirty fight. Uh, even though Teixeira has a great ground game and he is the better ground fighter, there's no question. I mean, his jiu-jitsu skill trumps Anderson for sure. So on the ground, Teixeira is the better ground fighter, but the wrestling is going to be interesting. I think Anderson could maybe take his back up against the cage, kind of grind him out, slow the fight down a little bit, just make it an ugly fight. Uh, you know, maybe follow the, the same type of blueprint that Phil Davis had against him. Different fighters, I know. Brian actually touched on this a little bit before uh, we started the podcast as well, and he he kind of relayed the same things. I mean, that would be a way that Anderson might be able to sneak out a win here. Um, you don't expect it as much, but still, I, I think it's possible, and I think Anderson is going to make this an ugly the slow it down kind of fight. And if he could keep uh, his hands up and not get clipped, I think he could win this fight on the cards. So I am going to pick or possibly again. I mean, again, I wouldn't be surprised if he finishes to share either because to is not getting any younger and he has a bit of a suspect chin. So either one, either way could get a knockout here, but I think Anderson, if he hits the scorecards, he might edge it out here. So, I'm going to pick Anderson to actually get the W over to share. Stylistically, it doesn't seem like the best matchup for him, but as long as he don't get clipped, I think he can win his fight. So, that's why I'm going to go his way. So, again, against the grain, I know most people are pitch, picking Teixeira in his spot here, but, you know, the matchup it, is definitely intriguing, and I think it's going to be another solid win, um, surprising win for Anderson, but a solid win for him, and he continues to climb up that ladder. So the pick is Corey Anderson to defeat Glover Teixeira. Anderson could win this fight, but my main problem with him here is he doesn't have a very good chin, he doesn't have a lot of power, and he's not a great striker. Um, so if he wins, he probably has to take Teixeira down and keep him down. And that's been done before, as we mentioned, in the Phil Davis thing. Um, that was probably Glover's most convincing loss other than, you know, to Anthony Johnson. But um, Corey Anderson isn't as good as Phil Davis. He's not as quite as good of a wrestler, and he definitely doesn't have the, the top position and uh, submission 
defense and submission offense that Davis had where he was able to just dominate Teixeira on the ground. Um, Teixeira actually has a very accomplished Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu game, so if Anderson does shoot in and take him down, I think he's going to be in a little bit of danger. I mean, Teixeira does have some pretty good uh, submission ability. Um, I don't know how great his sweeps are and everything, but uh, we'll definitely find out if Anderson is using that offensive wrestling. Now, on the feet, while Teixeira isn't quite as fast as he used to be, he's still a threat. He has power. He has some pretty good technical boxing ability. And while he doesn't have a very good chin, um, neither does Corey Anderson. And Teixeira has way more power. So if they're standing and trading on the feet, I think Teixeira has a very good chance of hurting Anderson and potentially putting him away. And Teixeira has gone to his offensive grappling a lot more lately. And uh, like in his last fight against Serkunov, where he shot and took the fight to the floor, advanced, and then just pounded away until Serkunov got TKO'd. So... That is another path to victory because if Teixeira can get top position, I think Anderson's in big trouble. Uh, Teixeira has very good ground and pound. He hits hard and Anderson doesn't have very good durability. So if Teixeira can find openings to land his heavy hands, whether it's in top position on the ground or standing, I think Corey Anderson's in trouble. But if Anderson can put Teixeira on his back and keep him there, then that's his path to victory as well. So I can understand why some people think this fight is close, but I just think that Teixeira's power is going to be the difference maker here. So I'm going to side with Teixeira. Now, moving on to the main event of the evening. In the light heavyweight division, we have Mauricio Shogun Hua, who is 24 and 10, taking on Anthony Smith, who is 29 and 13. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Smith opened minus 175. Shogun Hua open minus or plus 135. So minus 175 Smith Hua plus 135. Right now, looking for BJSI, it's actually minus 204 for Smith. The comeback on Hua is at plus 169. So Shogun still the underdog, a little bit more actually coming in Smith's way. This line ballooned up to like 300, I believe. Uh, maybe pass out of some spots and then it's coming back down to reality right now as well. So another setup fight. I mean, that's what's tricky about these cards like this when they're matching up, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say a young guy because I mean, Anthony Smith's been around the sport for a long, long time and he's faced a lot of solid competition even before he made it over to the UFC. We all know that, but he's still only 29 years old. So, you know, fight years is beyond that a little bit, but as far as UFC goes and, and his recent run, I mean, Anthony Smith's never looked better. So this is another one of these matchups where you're going to see a guy that's kind of on a decline in Shogun getting matched up with Anthony Smith that's moved up to the light heavyweight division. And man, did he look good and, and just destroying um, Rashad Evans in his last fight. So the size, I mean, he didn't look small by any means. He looked like a very filled out, strong light heavyweight. And I think that it was probably the right move, I mean, based on what we've seen so far. But this is going to be another solid test. I mean, Shogun, we all know how tough the guy is. I mean, the guy could take a beating. Even if you rock him, I mean, and, you know, he, he's the type of fighter that has so much heart that he doesn't go down easy. He's going to, you know, fight you to the end. And a lot of times he ends, ends up, even if he gets hurt early on in a fight, coming back and winning that fight. So Shogun is the better fighter overall. I, I know even though he's been around for a long time, this is 2018, and we're still talking about Shogun, who – main eventing here that's crazy if you think about it but you know i know he, he slowed down and he hasn't had as many fights through the years but he's still you know as being a part of the roster and actually being relevant it's amazing to me and that's because honestly he's gotten himself better i mean he was always one of the best fighters you know in this weight class even dating to the pride days but he's gotten smarter as his career's progressed and when he made it over to the ufc he actually got better with his takedown defense his ground game improved quite a bit we all know he had some submission skills from way back when but his wrestling's actually been a big factor and it's improved to the point where he can out wrestle people now as well so he is a smarter fighter he knows how to to win fights i mean he's proven it time and time again i know anthony smith is going to be dangerous in this spot um but I think what's going to happen here is actually on the feet, it could, it could realistically go either way. I mean, Smith is probably the more dangerous fighter right now because, again, 
Shogun's aging. Smith probably has a better chin in, you know, this version of uh, Shogun compared to Smith. So Smith probably has a better chin, obviously, and he's a more dangerous striker. But I think Shogun is going to be the one that mixes things up well enough. I mean, Shogun's always dangerous on the feet. He's got one punch knockout power. He can get the fight to the floor. His wrestling is probably underestimated. I think he's going to wrestle here. Smith is not the easiest guy to take down, but I think that's a path to victory for Shogun. Mix in some takedowns. Get on the ground and try to work your ground game a little bit over Smith because I think Shogun does have an edge on of the edge on the ground in this spot here as well. So a lot of people are thinking this is going to probably stay upright and we're going to see a stand up war with Smith getting the better of it. I think Shogun's going to actually try to wrestle here and probably get some takedowns along the way and maybe pull it off. Now, if it stay, if stay standing, I mean, honestly, whoever lands first is the type of scenario here. I think even though Smith has a better chin, Shogun has proven time and time again, he still has that knockout power. So I do think if it stays upright, Smith has the edge, but I think as as far as mixed martial arts go and a more complete fighter, Shogun is still at this point. Even though Smith is a pretty solid fighter in all aspects of the game himself, I think Shogun hasn't beat. So I can't believe I'm picking Shogun in a main event um, in, in 2018, but I'm going to have to do it. I think he's a better fighter, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if he pulls off the upset. So I wouldn't lay the chalk. I wouldn't lay 2-1 to one against him, that's for sure. So my pick is actually going to be Shogun to pull off the upset win. And I could definitely see Shogun winning this fight. I mean, he was actually training to fight at this contest, and Smith is stepping in on relatively short notice. Not not that much, but uh, enough short notice. And uh, while Shogun is much more experienced, and I would say, you know, five, ten years ago, Shogun would absolutely obliterate Anthony Smith. Shogun is getting up there in years, and especially in the wear and tear he's absorbed over his career. Um, I mean, he's been in so many wars, and at 36 years old, he's actually in fight years, like in his 40s, for sure. Um, and Anthony Smith is seemingly on the rise. Uh, I mean, he's had a nice little run at middleweight, and then decided that, you know, with his frame, it would make a lot more sense to move up to light heavyweight, and then had a successful light heavyweight debut by crushing Rashad Evans, uh, a former champion. So he's taking on his next uh, veteran that's on a decline in uh, his second consecutive bout. Uh, now, uh, Hua definitely does have more left in the tank than Rashad did. I mean, he is on a three-fight winning streak, but uh, Shogun also doesn't have nearly the chin that he used to have, and Smith does have a lot of power. So I could definitely see Smith hurting Hua on the feet, potentially putting him away. Um, I could also see Hua uh, cracking Smith. I mean, Smith did get beat up pretty badly by Diago Santos, who is a very savvy and solid striker. So if uh, Hua can get his kicking game going, he does have heavy hands, um, he could connect on Smith and do some damage. Um, Smith is going to be the taller fighter, but they have the same reach. Um, and then as Nick mentioned, while Smith does have a, a pretty good ground game and he's kind of crafty with uh, using his long limbs to get triangle chokes and other things off of his back, um, he doesn't really pull off a ton of submissions. So if Hua does drag this fight to the floor, he's going to have an edge. But uh, the main thing that I'm worried about overall is the fact that Hua is uh, slowing down. He's having tougher and tougher uh, fights. And I think having only fought once per year about the last four years, that uh, we could definitely be seeing uh, near the end of Hua. Um, granted, he is on a little win streak, but I mean, it wasn't that long ago that people were asking him to retire. So uh, I think that Hua will be competitive here, but I'm definitely nervous about his chin. And I think Anthony Smith actually, if he connects solidly, will do some serious damage and put Hua away. So I'm actually going to side with Anthony Smith. I think that his power is uh, pretty scary and while he has slowed down in fights, he's also picked up multiple late stoppages. So I'm definitely not going to underestimate his conditioning either. So I'm going to side with Anthony Smith. I'm not that confident about it, but I do think that the younger fighter with less wear and tear can get the job done. So that'll do it for our full event breakdown for UFC Fight Night 133. If we have a free play to give out, make sure to follow at MMAOB Premium on Twitter because that's where we'll post it first. 
We can also notify you of our free bets via email alert if you prefer that method. Just send an email to picks at MMAoddsbreaker.com and we'll add you to our free bet mailing list. Special thanks to BetDSI. Good luck, everyone, and hopefully the betting gods are on your side this weekend.